Hey, everybody, if you like martial arts, such as MMA, you, such as MMA, boxing, Kyokushin Karate, kickboxing, Glory, K1, make sure to subscribe to the Drew Spirience podcast that's on YouTube and all audio platforms. Uh, the show is brought to you by a few supporters, such as KRT Tips and Tricks with Sensei's Wesley Jensen and Darren Stringer, uh, Kyokushin Shuffle podcast uh, by Sensei Patrick Pinto, and uh, Marshall Way blog with Scott Heaney and Shean Terry Burkett, who do real talk show. And uh, lastly, if you're an up and coming MMA fighter or a Kyokushin kickboxer that wants to get become professional and you're looking for a good management team, I look no further than Moments Management. They are the, they are co- the best in the business where Nima Safapur and his team will make sure that you're, you're educated in terms of before becoming pro, during pro, and after to make sure you leave successfully with, ri- with abundance and uh, riches in uh, your bank account and to make sure that you are successful moving forward. Moments Management, where quality and care come first. And today's guest today, wow, been on the, this has been uh, a long time coming and um, he's got an interesting story. He's actually done Kyokushin Karate, he's done Enchin Karate as well. And then he became an entrepreneur to open up his own MMA gym where he has a staple of killers, both amateur and pro in Virginia, USA. He is the one and only Nima Mazari. Welcome, Nima. Thanks for coming. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> how's everything? Uh, so how's um, this year been for you with, uh, in terms of uh, the amateur and the pro scene? Well, um, uh, you want me to start from the beginning of how this uh, MMA started for me? Or you want me to just go straight to your question? <laughs> they're all kind of uh, like related you know what i mean like i yeah. i um i've been um uh, doing and teaching martial arts for 35 years wow um, so it's been a long time and uh, i've been to different uh, style of martial arts started with actually chinese martial arts for two years then um then i i kind of like like to learn japanese martial arts as well then i started kyukushin then uh, I did Taekwondo with Kyokushin. Then I started learning boxing. Um, so I'm, I always was a big fan of like uh, mixed martial arts. Even back in the day when um, everybody, no, no coach wanted to see his student like uh, just go around and cross train with other styles and other gyms. I, I, I used to do that. And um, quite often I got punished for it, but uh, it, was, it was okay. You know, like I, I uh, now... People are a lot more open-minded, but back in old day, it was like one teacher philosophy. Mm-hmm. So nobody wanted you to cross train. So, uh, so I started actually learning like uh, multiple martial arts when I was young, and uh, eventually, um, you know, obviously, uh, I I started more. I fought more in Kyokushin and Enchin uh, style of fighting, and. Uh, my my students really accomplished even more than I did, and they won the world tournament. Japan, I had fighters that took them to Japan, and they won all Japan in female and male, and uh, Europe and world tournament. And uh, then eventually, you know, they they were they wanted more challenges. They came to me and they wanted to do MMA, and so then I was like, you know what, um, you want to learn MMA, you got to do wrestling, you got to do. Uh, well, actually, first they wanted to do kickboxing. They said that we wanted to do kickboxing. So uh, we started doing kickboxing because I had boxing background before. I understood, I knew exactly, like, how to deal with, like, uh, uh, you know, kickboxing and stuff. So we, I trained them, and they quickly, actually, because they were already world class, it was easy for them to, you know, um, to switch to kickboxing and they did really good in kickboxing. They won like IKF world title uh, in amateur um, uh, Muay Thai and kickboxing. And after that, they're like, we, now we need a new goal. <laughs> we, we, we did good with kickboxing. Uh, we want to do MMA. And then, uh, you know, I had to kind of like uh, help them in the process. So I brought a wrestling coach and I brought a just a black belt, one of the uh, first uh, 17 black belts under Helsin Gracie. Mm-hmm. I brought him to my uh, academy and we started an MMA program. So this way they don't have to go anywhere else. So I brought everything to the gym and uh, 
I had a lot of talent, so they quickly picked up. Because once you have the mentality of a martial arts and you're a black belt, you know how to be a good student, especially if you're an instructor. So they picked up quickly, and then they started winning uh, on the amateur uh, platforms over here. And one of them actually, he ended up actually in Bellator too, you know. He, he, he did really good, and um, he's still fighting. Um, and, uh, well, that's how basically started uh, our amateur uh, platform started. And eventually some of them went pros and people are like, what is this gym and so on. And um, they had never, they didn't have the idea that Japanese martial arts can translate to mixed martial arts. But for us, it was easy because we already had judo background and we already had like Kyokushin, uh, which was uh, kind of like the bare knuckle, full contact. We were so used to getting hit. <laughs> so um, then people showed more interest to come and train, and our team pretty much grew. And right now, we're pretty much the biggest uh, MMA team in Northern Virginia area. I don't know any other gym that is the same size as our, our team. And uh, we have, like, a fight training camp. It means, like, we have a platform for fighters to come and just – uh, start uh, amateur uh, from amateur. Uh, it's a pretty much like a full time setup for them, so they can come and train just like big training camps that you see, like uh, American Top Team, uh, uh, Extreme Couture, and all Tri-Star. those. Tri Star. Yeah, so Tri Star exactly. We have like two hour morning training for all the fighters for the tight fight team every day, and at night they go to supplemental classes. So we have people come from different backgrounds, like somebody's a boxer, so he needs like more like uh, kickboxing and wrestling and jiu-jitsu. So at night, they go to the classes that they need. We call them makeup classes. Mm. So they, they meet together in the morning for two, two hours, then they scattered in different programs at night. Mm. Interesting. And now, now we have like yeah. four locations. Yeah. So every, every fighter, you know, has his own, uh, you know, uh, coach. And some of them actually are like affiliated with other um, organizations or like, let's say, there is someone that is a jiu-jitsu black belt has his own he has his own like academy and teach but then they come over here for mma training mm, interesting so in the, earlier in the conversation you said that you were growing up and you were experimenting with first kyokushin then taekwondo now this is something that i have to ask because there's kind of like this tribalism where the kyokushin got where the taekwondo guys feel that that Kyokushin, it's good, but they can't move as fast as they can. But then in Kyokushin, it's the power and the pressure that, you know, it's all up to the martial artist, as they say. But when you were learning Taekwondo, like with Kyokushin, how do you feel that the philosophy of Kyokushin and then learning Taekwondo, how did that help you as a martial artist? So here is very, there's a long story. Um, but back in old days, they used to say ultimate of stand up is Taekwondo. For kicks and uh, striking for boxing, mm-hmm. and they were like, "If you learn these two sports together, you're gonna have great uh, uh, boxing skills, and you're gonna have great kicks." So even though I was doing kickshin, so I wanted to, I wanted to basically learn uh, learn both uh, disciplines. So and there used to um, be a park in uh, Tehran that's still there, and I know there are a lot of. Uh, Fighters, they meet each other every every Friday because Friday is their like a day off. It's like their Sunday. So I used to we used to go there at five a.m. and train from five until like noon. So then a lot of like uh, martial artists like from different styles they they, they go over there. Sometimes they have like some. Uh, we used to even do like a uh, kind of uh, uh, matches. You know, we set rules and just boom, we just uh, fight and sometimes uh, kickboxing, sometimes like. Uh, uh, boxing and so I I had the opportunity to spar with a lot of Taekwondo guys especially like when I say Taekwondo I'm not talking about like regular black belt I was talking about like people that I trained with over there they were like world class so it's different you know it feels different when somebody world class uh, you know and you train you respect their uh, skills because they have competed in top level like uh, like people like Fatty Boards Asghari or uh, this guy is, is world class. He is, he has a lot of accomplishment. Or uh, Mehman Deuce, or like uh, uh, forgot the names, but um, uh, some really good good Taekwondo guys. So you 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 spar with them, you're like, 
holy crap, you know, I, this is a real deal. Then you, then you, you want to learn, you want to learn from them. And so you used to, I used to train, um, comparing Taekwondo with, um, with Kikushin, you know, I, I, I'll always say like every, every style of martial arts is, has its own advantage and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. The biggest disadvantage for Taekwondo is just like, they really don't know what to do when you're chest to chest with them, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and that's what actually Kikushin is good at. I knew also ancient, I knew like judo throws, so I could just do takedown and so on. I hope that I answer your question. Uh, so yeah, I went, I guess, like a little bit of a each. Uh, uh, but uh, Kyukushin, what I got from Kyukushin that I think that helped me a lot, and uh, um, uh, the body toughness. You know, I, I, I really believe that if you are able to absorb um, kicks and punches, and if you're not afraid to get hit, then the level of focus is different. When your opponent's coming in and you're not afraid to get hit, you can easily like tag him with good shots. And uh, that showed in even K K1, when Kyokushin fighters started challenging uh, kickboxers in K1 tournaments, they were not great, great boxers, but they could get hit. So they, they just, they were waiting for that shot. When the guy is throwing a punch or throwing a kick, they just like wait for that shot. Uh, they call it Ichigeki, all right? Yeah. So they're looking for that one shot, to, for not one shot knockout. And they get, they had a lot of success with that. Like Francisco Filho, for example, in, in K1, when he fought like, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Ernesto Hussain, for example. And so they just look for that final shot because they're not afraid to get hit. And I, I, I truly believe that if, you, if your physical toughness is in a, like a good level, uh, you're not afraid to spar, and then you're not afraid of hard sparring, and and you do better, you know, overall. And and that helped me a lot in any sport that I entered, um, because I did boxing after I did kickboxing, I did taekwondo after I did kickboxing, so I was not afraid to get hit. So I fought, I fought like a lot of big tough guys, so uh, that helped me tremendously in my in my career, and I passed it on to my uh, students too. I I really really like push them so much on the body toughness so mm -hmm. they get they, they get that kind of mentality you know that's inter interesting now because you're from iran so i'm half iranian too i don't look it but i could send you a photo of my dad after I'll be like, yeah he's <laughs> iranian so my dad was born in tehran came to canada in 1965 and as i get older um the one thing when i as i started my martial arts journey iran is a superpower for combat sports like w do you believe like that Iran was like bred, like Iranians, like were were like born to like be either in wrestling or maybe other forms of combat sports. Yeah. So here's uh, first of all, martial arts um, after soccer is the second, at least when I was there, was the second big sport mm -hmm. in uh, in Iran. And also there are a lot of uh, benefits that athletes uh, have in Iran. For example, like if you if you open a, um, a sport gym martial arts academy uh you get uh, exempted to pay taxes so a lot of people like to actually invest in sports so you can find like uh, a lot of martial arts uh, uh academies all over the country that's one thing also i guess uh uh they have also less options as far as uh as far as like uh, uh you know goals go you know uh, and everybody wants to kind of like uh because, you know, because of the economy and all that stuff, everybody wants to find a way to be successful. So once they started like a, any kind of any kind of career, they really want to push uh, to be on the top level. So maybe they get the opportunity to go to big flat platform and open a door for them to be successful in their life. Maybe get some uh, good money from the government, uh, maybe to be able to travel all over the world and maybe they get a, a contract with another gym to uh, maybe they teach over there and, and so on. But uh, martial arts in general is very, very strong in, 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 in Iran, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of uh, uh, karate or taekwondo or even boxing, kickboxing. There are a lot of good, good kickboxers in Iran, really good. They really and are. unfortunately, uh, many of them, they don't get that opportunity to fight in the platform because um, – a sport is regulated just like everything else. So uh, basically everything is like government run and um, under government control. So like, for example, they have to they pass through the government to go to a big platform. 
So it means like um, not, you know, I always believe that there are a lot of good fighters that they don't get the opportunity to go out of Iran just because government government doesn't let them compete uh, out, out of the country. You know what I mean? Kind of sounds like a Soviet style system where like in the NHL, like when in the NHL, like when we wanted the Russian players to come, the only way they could come is if they defected. So it does, there is like exactly, a parallel exactly. I see with that, with those two systems. It is. Yeah. And then they have actually a, a, uh, a, a sex, section in the government that they, they filter the fighters that go out of the country, not just the fighter, any athlete. Um, I forgot the name, uh, but basically, if you win, if you win, because I they they rejected me a couple of times to go, and the reason that I am out is because I was able to independently leave and compete, and I, I put myself in trouble. Actually, I fought mm -hmm. in World Cup in uh, Denmark uh, back in 1995. When I went back, they they put me in in jail, and they uh, yeah they put me in jail. And then they said, you did not have the permission from the government. And who do you think you, you are? Who supported this? And, uh, and I really did good. And I had some press conference with some big media, uh, like especially VOA. You, you know VOA, right? Voice of America. It's I, like, yeah. Yeah. So the thing and, is, and yeah. Danish, uh, I, got, I was the runner-up in the World Cup in 1995. So they didn't care like, how, how, what you accomplished. They cared that you did not get any permission and you went out there, you fought. So, so they put me in prison. Then um, I had to put bond to get out. And after actually two years uh, of back and forth and going to court and going back home and then government was not allowing me to compete uh, outside of Iran because of that, even though I won like uh, like all Iranian championship in the open weight in Kyukushin, uh, they rejected me and uh, they took somebody else. And so eventually I, I didn't have any future in Iran, so I had to leave. And there are so many athletes that have the same story as me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like there's one, like one Iranian superstar in MMA is Gegard Mousasi, although like he is Armenian, Iranian, but in the UFC encyclopedia, which I have, you see the Iran flag. So it's one of the examples, like just right. to say. Yeah. I mean, like once you win, like, let's say you win like uh, a win first place in whatever sport, then your name goes to this uh, department. Then they do a background check. They look and see if you are the right fit for their team and if you're going to represent the country the way they want to be seen. You know what I mean? Like if you are religious, if you put beard, you know what I mean? Like if you pray or, or something, what kind of clothes you wear? Like uh, they warn me a couple of times why I wear jeans and why I bring my fighters to compete with, with like uh, improper, like a, uh, you know cloth clothing you know what i mean like so they have like some uh, there's some shit going on out there you know and can't tell you how terrible it is but still like people are passionate and they they love martial arts and they they do it because they they love it and also the other thing is that um just like many many other countries like uh when you when people come to learn martial arts they want they want something that is going to you know teach them the act the, the actual like self defense because they know they're going to have to use it on the street. People are crazy out there, you know. They can just, like, beat you up for no reason. You just, it's just the way it is. So people are more, like, into, like, serious martial arts than just tip-tap, you know, uh, game. Exactly. There's a, so, you know, you were competing in Kyokushin. You were going international and now, and you almost fought, uh, you almost fought, if, we were to, if I remember from our chat, like, when we were getting to know each other, you almost fought Glaube. Betoza. I have fought a lot of big names in the mm -hmm. Kyokushin uh, tournament. When I yeah. came, when I was in Iran, mm -hmm. uh, I was a, the, uh, I was basically all Iranian champion, but mm -hmm. uh, they were not allowing me to fight outside of Iran uh, because I, I left Iran and I fought without their permission. Mm -hmm. So um, then they were not allowing me to compete. So my goal, my my dream was to fight in World Kyokushin tournament, the one that happens every three years and so on. So I I couldn't fight uh, because of the, the all the restrictions was on me. So when I came here, I fought in a, uh, uh, what you call it, um, uh, America's Cup in New York mm -hmm. City. That's the the biggest Kyokushin tournament where they sponsor the top best, top ten world uh, world uh, class Kyokushin fighters 
from the world, all over the world. Uh, so um, I fought Glauber Petosa uh, in New York City. He had four fights. One opponent didn't show up. Three, they got knocked out. I was the only one that went to distance, and we had overtime, two overtime. Whoa. And uh, I lost by decision. I was a little bit lazy in the last round, I thought, because I was, it was going to a decision again. And I was like 10 pounds lighter than him. You know, if you're 10 pounds lighter, you win. So I was trying to kind of like, uh, uh, I got a little bit lazy. I tried to kind of like uh, just uh, control the fight to the end. But then it cost me like the, uh, the fight and they won him. They gave him the decision. I should have pushed a little bit more. If I think I, I knew that I had enough in me to push more and, and take it to decision, and I would win the decision because I was the lighter fighter. I was like more than 10 pounds lighter than him. Mm -hmm. He was like 230, and I was like 210. So I was oh. like 20 pounds heavier than him, lighter than him. And uh, then after the fight, actually, um, Xi'an Garai, um, he came to me and he said that uh, um, uh, if I could fight for a USA team in world tournament, because USA uh, does not have a very like solid uh, uh, Kyushin team, but unfortunately, uh, my, you know, um, I, I was not able to go because uh, because of my visa situation. Mm -hmm. So I lost the opportunity. But I fought some big fights. Uh, I fought Sasaki Zander. I don't know if you know him or not. Zander dropped uh, Jean Rivière with uppercut. You know Jean yeah. Rivière, a Canadian guy. Uh, yeah. uh, he was one of the best uh, Kyushin, one of the first uh, Canadian. I fought Xander. We went to decision. We had overtime. I fought Marcus Fullen, again, from um, uh, from the same uh, uh, Brazilian uh, group. I, I fought a lot of, like, uh, I, I never had any problem with East Europeans. I, I most won fighters against, uh, I don't know, like Serbia and uh, Poland and uh, uh, Czech Republic and so on. So I had, I fought a lot in Kyukushin. I have probably over, over 100 fights. Uh, uh, just in Kyokushin tournament. Amazing. That's, um, that's awesome. So then, um, but then unfortunately I couldn't fight in the in the main uh, world tournament because of the visa issue that I had. If I left, I could not come back. That was the issue. <laughs> so then you get into Enshin. And uh, by the way, guys, if uh, for any of those who are going to watch this, he does have highlights. He sent it. And maybe uh, there's a YouTube channel called Michael Mouse Boxer that has all the Enshin tournaments somehow. So they might be able to find you on that. So talk about right, your yeah. journey into Enshin from Kyokushin. Right. Yeah. So um, one of the reasons I left Kyokushin was just the same thing because they were not, Kyokushin uh, was controlled by government and the top uh, high uh, ranked Kyokushin people. They were like uh, pretty much like like the head of the the brand chief of Iran was basically one of the uh, what you call that uh, he was one of the Iranian diplomat in Japan so in the Iranian embassy in Japan so he had too much power and 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 he just crushed uh, non-religious uh, community in Iran in Kyukushin. Mm -hmm. so a lot of them left and me I was one of them. So I decided to uh, go with a little bit more non-religious group, which um, uh, ancient organization was one of them. And their base was in USA and Contra Jokoninomia was in USA. So I left Kyokushin because of that. And I liked the idea to join Enshin because I would gain something different. So because uh, Enshin is a blend of Kyokushin and Judo. So I, I, I started learning Judo. It was something different. A lot of stand-up grappling takedowns. And uh, it helped me with with uh, with with MMA career. That's awesome. And then you started competing in Enshin. And what was that like to to get the TV exposure when you were uh, stepping on that tatami? Yeah, I mean, like uh, it was big. Enshin is uh, people don't understand Enshin, uh, which actually the tournament that they put they don't call it Enshin World. They, they call it Sabaki Challenge. Mm -hmm. So Baki Challenge was actually the platform for UFC that people don't even know. So back in the day uh, in Denver, Colorado, Sabaki so Challenge was the biggest uh, basically contact uh, sport. Mm -hmm. And it was on pay-per-view channel. So in 1996, I fought in Macnico Arena. It was, uh, it was Ice Hockey Stadium. There were 7,000 people there, and it was a paper on pay-per-view TV. And um, basically... 
Sabaki challenge was uh, uh, based on uh, they have they had three slogans: no pad, no gloves, uh, full contact. And uh, UFC came in and they saw that uh, MMA. I mean, this tournament was very big in Denver. That's why UFC started in Denver. Uh, if you look at the history, and they went to the same venues that I fought. Like they they put uh, their first fights in uh, Magnico Arena. The Colosseum, uh, Mammoth Event Center. I fought in these uh, venues, um, so they had the they had the fan for this. They had the fan for sport. So and UFC came in. They we had a circle. Uh, our tatami was circle. It was not square. And um, so they made a they they built a cage. They made a cage, and the slogan from three jump to five. They said no pad, no gloves, no rules, no time, full contact. And uh, the first fighters, uh, some of the first fighters in UFC one, two, three, are the the, the champions of some of the champions of uh, uh, Sabaki Challenge. Like for mm -hmm. example, Patrick Smith uh, uh, was the Sabaki Challenge heavyweight champion back in the day. I know, I'm sure you know all know pa Patrick Smith. He was he's UFC a pioneer. One, two. Yeah, and he fought even Andy uh, Hook in uh, in K1, and he knocked out Andy in the first fight and second round. He lost. He so, uh, unfortunately he passed uh, away though I think I heard he passed away though like about a year ago. Who, Andy? No, Patrick Andy, Smith. Yeah. Patrick, I'm not sure. Um, um, I am not sure he passed away or not, but he was in prison for a while. I don't know for what, but he was out, and they were his manager was looking for a uh, uh, looking to put him in MMA again, mm -hmm. and uh, and so on. I don't know what happened, and I, I have no idea. But anyways, uh, so. Sabaki Challenge was one of the biggest uh, stays for fighters, and they used to actually pay fighters back in the old day. And once UFC came and put they put those sh shows, they started putting. Uh, uh, if you remember, they put sanction on uh, like uh, that kind of fights. Uh, then they they started regulating it, and so uh, once they stopped UFC, our event got spot stopped too. Sabaki Challenge got stopped. And they said, you cannot do bare knuckle. You got to put gloves and so on. Same thing that happened to UFC. It really affected like a uh, Sabaki challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but so, that was the downside of actually Sabaki challenge tournament. But UFC came with rules and they kind of like, uh, they modified it and they went, went back in there and they com com continued. But Sabaki challenge, uh, it kind of like got downsized because of what happened to it. Mm, interesting but but like that was like such a high point like i just feel like you stepped in like in an experimental stage because like the 90s were was like okay the 80s obviously people were finding out about computers the 90s was that real you know guinea pig era so how do you what did what do you what what do you feel was made like so martial arts so popular in the 90s aside from the ufc was there like an actor or actors you feel that helped get people enrolled into martial arts i i don't know about the u.s because i wasn't here to tell you what happened over here you know to be honest but i can tell you in in iran uh martial arts has had always been um uh, popular because they didn't have a lot of hobbies you know they could they could not go to club they could not go to you know the, to to entertain themselves so it was very popular but i really believe that um uh kikushin made it very popular because kikushin was huge in iran i remember one year i fought in um in a kikushin tournament after three days we made it to top top eight of each each weight division mm -hmm. and they said that the, the they we have no time to continue this so we're going to continue the event the, later I fought in competition like like the 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 all Iranian um, the championship that I fought. There were 255 people in one division. They had the, they had only one winner. So so first they put them in two divisions, then the uh, like minus 170, uh, and then uh, plus 170 kilogram. I mean one uh, not seven, 70 kilogram and plus. Then they fought each other and the winners they top two they fought each other and then. They uh, the winners went to final and they fought each other, so awesome. it was huge. Like to win, like uh, uh, you know how what we used to say. We used to say the difference between two hundred people and four hundred people is only don't only one fight because it was single. It's 
that's how we used to just give ourselves like some kind of a uh, energy because you're thinking like oh shit i have to fight like 400 people and like oh the difference between 400 and 200 is only one fight don't worry <laughs> you're not gonna fight them all you know so exactly. it was like huge very big that's awesome so you know, you know, you've seen both the amateur side of MMA and the pro side. And when everyone gets into the MMA, they always watch the UFC. That's like the first one because they're so good at marketing. But what may, why do you feel it's important? Why do you feel it's important? People should also follow the amateur circuit. What can they get from it if they're getting into the sport as a spectator? You mean like amateur? Why? They, what they're looking for? Yeah, like exactly. Like, why should why is it so important? Why do you feel it's important that people should support the amateur leagues before the pros too? Okay, okay. Obviously, like everybody at some point was an amateur fighter, mm -hmm. so all the toughest fighters in, in that are coming up, they all like amateur first. So they they get the experience, you know. Like they gotta, they need to, um, they need to do their homework before they go to that big platform. And if they don't, I usually keep my, my fighters in amateur career for a long time. I don't let them go pro quickly until uh, I have my own, like, uh, curriculum for them. Like, if they want to get, like, a, for example, for first fight, they need to have fairly good striking. They need to have escape from every, every position, at least minimum two escapes, like two submission from each position. And they need to be able to get back up and they need to have wrestling. For example, that's if you get a first fight. So I have my own... Uh, because it's, it's very important. They need to do their homework. But um, some fighters, sometimes they make shortcuts. Some fighters, they cannot even have amateur fights. I, uh, I had fighters that came from, for example, the guy had 200 fights in Lumpini and in, uh, in Thailand and so on. He could, not go, uh, he could not fight amateur, so he had to go straight pro. So everybody has a path, but if somebody has an opportunity to complete an amateur career, even if they have been in uh, Olympic boxing or Olympic uh, uh, level of wrestling, I think it's good for them to have at least like one or two amateur fights before they go pro. Do you feel that more should be done to put like more like investment, investing like uh, and uh, money into the amateur scene in order to like make sure that we're getting quality fighters that come to the pros? Because these amateur events sometimes it's kind of up and down of like how things are being developed it also depends on the gym so do you feel maybe like more investment from like big name players are you talking would help? About investment is government investment or or gym no investment? no more I, I i don't i'm someone that prefers private investment like if we had more private investors do you think that could maybe help the quality of uh, the sport in the amateur circuit um honestly like no matter what there's going to be people that have great skills when they turn pro and there are going to be some people that are, they, they miss uh, some part of it. You know, it all depends on the coach, but I, I truly believe that uh, an amateur fighter before they go pro, they need to be like, at least like, for example, purple belt level of jujitsu. Mm -hmm. uh, at least if they have two, four, four pro fight, they need to be brown belt. If you have eight pro fight, they need to be black belt level. So, um, it all depends on the fighters, to be honest. But um, I, I truly believe if if um, if an amateur fighter does not invest in all the elements that um, that are in the game, then they they're not gonna succeed. Uh, so it's just planting the seed for future. I actually uh, I actually on my uh, TV page on my Instagram, I kind of like put a map for uh, Iranian people because a lot of them still like their not they're very new to MMA uh, and they they are very they just approved MMA in Iran after 20 years that is that people are doing it uh, still they don't like the concept of calling it cage uh, they want to call it something else anyway because they believe cage is inappropriate in the, in the term cage is inappropriate cage is like for you know animals you know what I mean like that's how they they word it but um, so. Uh, there, there is a map, you know, there's a map that you have to follow. If, uh, if you don't, um, I made a chart pretty much like where you start from and how, how you need to develop it and, and so on. If, if you are in the, if you do not follow that, that map, somehow it's somewhere it, you're going to pay the price for it when you go pro and you're not going to have a successful pro career. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. let's say i'm a kyokushin fighter okay so kyokushin as you said they're very good at making their body tough um 
And what I like, so I have my, uh, my coach, his name's Mo and Mo has a philosophy that he feels that for him, according to him, like the best combos I'm paraphrasing here are learn Kyokushin, then boxing and wrestling. Why? Because wrestling and Kyokushin have that mental side of the toughness too, like to really make you tougher. Do you feel that's a, a good mix to have if you're a Kyokushin fighter coming into pro MMA? So you said boxing and wrestling Kyokushin? and wrestling and wrestling. Mm-hmm. What about uh, uh, submission grappling? Submissions too, but like the for the main three, like if you're coming into ad, like that's uh what like in the the main three, like. So honestly, yeah. to me, wrestling is the most important sport for uh, mixed martial arts because rec- wrestlers dictate the fight. Mm-hmm. If they see that they can win the fight standing, they can just keep the fight standing. If they feel like they're getting overwhelmed standing, they can take the fight to the ground. So to me, wrestling is a first uh, first element in the game. Then um, uh, obviously, if I wanted to pick boxing or kickboxing or kickboxing, first, if somebody like come to my, if you bring like a wrestler to my gym, for example, I have like good work class, good wrestlers here. So I tell them like, okay, you know what? Striking, only boxing first. The reason boxing is go and watch like, um, uh, what's the name? Uh, UFC fights and see how many punches and how many kicks get delivered. 80% is boxing, 80% is hand. And the reason is anytime you lift your leg up, you expose, expose yourself to take down, you get off balance. You're standing on one leg, you're not, you're not gonna have good balance. There's so many like uh, good uh, fighters now, they have found a way to catch your leg when you kick. So as soon as you kick, they catch your leg and then they just dump you on your back and then they get on, get on top. So I think that uh, boxing gives you a good balance because you're on feet, on both feet, uh, and, and also has great footwork. So I, if a wrestler show up in my class, first I give them boxing for six months or, or eight months or 10 months or something. Once they're really good in boxing, I also send them to um, do some amateur um, boxing and do like some smoker boxing. Then they start adding kicks to it. So if you want to compare like Kyokushin and how a Kyokushin fighter, obviously Kyokushin has great kicks. They have great kicks. They have great body toughness, but body toughness worth uh, nothing if somebody is holding you and want to take you to the ground. If a, if a wrestler is holding on to you, uh, then body toughness is not going to help. Body toughness only help if you're, if, if you're standing and banging with your opponent and punching. But obviously, uh, Boxing is a great complementary sport for Kyokushin, for sure. And Kyokushin has great, uh, has great uh, uh, kicks. The kicks are, they, they have, it's been proven that Kyokushin had amazing kicks uh, and they work really good in, uh, you, like, do you know Jiga? Jiga Kikazi, Jiga, the uh, guy that just fought? Yeah, Jiga, he just fought, uh, uh, gosh. The Brazilian guy. What is his name right, right now? Giga uh, Chikadze, right? That's the one. The Georgian yeah, guy. Yeah. Georgian guy. He fought in glory. He's a Kyokushin fighter. And uh, he's got amazing kicks. He has, like, incredible middle kicks. And you saw, like, what, what, what he did with his kicks. But still, you definitely have to have good boxing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, again, close range, you need, again, like, you got to be well-rounded. You need to have wrestling to stop the takedowns to be able to. Yeah, I always say, even if you don't have, like, a great submission defense, you can be black belt in uh, takedown defense in one year. If you, mm-hmm. if you want to be great on the ground, it may take you, like, 10 years to be great on the ground, eight years to be great on the ground. But in one year, you can have good submission defense in black belt level submission defense if you – I'm sorry, not submission defense, um, takedown defense, like wrestling. For wrestling. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Is there a particular fighter? I mean, I know like, you know, you've been in the amateurs and the pro game. Is there like a particular yeah, fighter good. or fighters that you like to watch today that like make you go like, wow, I love watching this guy or girl fight? You know, I'm a, I'm a coach. So I, I have to watch a lot more than other people watch because anytime we get a fight offer, so I got like about like 20 some fighters on my, in my team. So anytime you get a fight, a fight offer, you have to watch. And my wife always is like, what's wrong with you? Even you're on, uh, on your phone, you're at home, you're watching like fights. I'm like, I'm not really watching fight to entertain myself. I'm watching fight to 
uh, analyze <laughs> analyze fighters. So I usually don't watch fight uh, just because I want to enjoy watching. Um, I I watch because you pick up little things and uh, and see where the game is going. You know, I have to be up to date. Uh, so uh, I don't I don't have any particular uh, fighter that I watch. To be honest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everything can be entertaining from wrestling to jujitsu, and yeah. But I, I just watch because I have to be up to date. Makes sense. What's the? What do you hope the future is? Like you know, as we get out of this pandemic, you know, like with COVID, what the, do you hope the future is for Kaizen MMA? And like, what's the next step you want to see happen for yourself as a coach and a business owner? Honestly, like, as far as what, as far as like. Uh, fight goes or as far as like uh, business goes <laughs> bit of both yeah a bit of both like you know because like you said you're because you do have one of the biggest gyms in Virginia and I'm sure like you want to have plans to like expand and maybe in like another state or two probably right um honestly I had like some people that showed interest to open uh, locations when I uh, started like taking fighters to Malaysia somebody reached out to me <laughs> And he wanted to open a Kaizen in Malaysia, for example, because, uh, you know, we went out there, we fought in um, 1FC and we won a couple of fights. But to me, I, I believe that there is only one uh, Harvard. There is only one Cambridge. Yeah. Once you branch out, then it's going to be like a McDonald's, you know what I mean? Mm. So I don't believe in expanding in other states unless – there is someone that trained over here for years and years and years that I can trust that he's going to represent the same uh, quality. And, uh, but I am not a big fan of opening a, a location somewhere where uh, uh, people are going to just like receive some YouTube videos from you and instructional and, and trip practice on your own. You need to feel it. You know, grappling is all about feel. You watch two grapplers are competing. You're not going to know until you, you, you really feel Wrestling is the same. You have to feel your opponent. So those are the stuff that you cannot really teach the student um, unless they, they, they physically do it with the teacher. So I, I – I, but over here, I'm not looking to expand. I'm, I'm more like looking to succeed more. And, uh, I mean, this pandemic hasn't been, like, bad for me, so we've done great. One of my fighters, uh, last year he won the – last winter he won the LFA title in Bantamweight. And he had the opportunity to fight in UFC. He signed, and then uh, he was going to fight, actually, like two weeks ago. And he got injured. I have a guy that is uh, signing with uh, PFL. So, and I have a couple of also new fighters coming um, because I'm a uh, Farsi-speaking uh, uh, coach, and I have a couple of Farsi-speaking. Like we have right now, a fighter just came from Tajikistan. He just mm-hmm. fought in Contender Series. He fought a, He lost a split decision in a very close fight. He made one small mistake in the first round, and he pulled a guillotine choke. Um, he thought that he was going to have it. He was out wrestling his opponent. He went on his back, and the guy threw some ground on pound. And, and just because of that little mistake, um, I guess the match went to decision, and he, he lost the split decision if he didn't make that mistake. So he's, he's here because he trusted us because we speak the same language. He wants to go back again and fight. He, he's... 17 wins, four losses, one draw, like a good, good record. So people started like learning more about like how we've been training and what we've been doing. So I'm on the right path. I, I'm not really pushing. I'm just doing what I love to do. And it's just coming. Business is the same. Mm-hmm. When I was open this place, I could, I was doing great in, uh, in the, the job that I had. I was making a lot of money, but I gave up on my job and I started this. My wife was like, you're crazy. Um, and my wife was so upset because my pay um, pretty much like uh, in two days was my, my wife was a teacher, was like one month of my wife's paycheck. My wife was like so upset when I quit my job. And she was super, super upset, but I, 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 this is what I want to do, you know? And that's why I ended up over here. Uh, and so uh, I did what I needed to do. I put all my heart and energy in it. People, once they see that you're, you're passionate, you're all in, they get inspired by you and they join and they grow. And we have four locations. We didn't really push 
tough four location, it just happened by itself. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we broke every single business concept that you could imagine. We didn't go by the book and everything worked because the concept behind it was all like love and passion. You have my support, honestly. Like, I love everything you just said. You, you're not one, because what I take from you, what I just heard is like with Kyokushin, there's so much politics in it. So what I want to do with what you just told me is take my show. And it doesn't matter if you're in like IKO or like the other ones, I'm going to talk to you and we're going to, and I'm going to try to build, make it unconventional to bridge everything together. So that's like- Yeah, um, Kyokushin yeah. Is still is one organization because some yeah. people on the top there, they have issues with each other. It doesn't mean that the people on the bottom should have, problem with each other no like it's uh that's i like like, but i just love what you do like it's just amazing you know you gotta you can't you gotta be an outlier like you have to you have to you know like i'm reading right now david versus goliath by malcolm gladwell and it's just such an interesting chapter about like how like when you're coming up and and all these concepts are put against you but really congrats like you really put the action in you don't just talk so i just want to say like a really big kudos to you nima Thank you. Thank you. So I want to say, you know, obviously, you know, cause you have a, cause you said we're running, you're running on a bit of a tight schedule today, but, um, w- and you know, I guess we'll, uh, conclude it here. Where can people connect with you on social media, whether like they're, they're coming down to like train they want or et cetera. Like what are your platforms they can reach you on? Yeah. I mean, like I have, uh, I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. You can, you can just put Nima Mazhari USA mm-hmm. and you can find me. And we have like a training camp uh, all year round. Uh, when I say full-time training camp, it means like uh, when somebody comes and want to train with me, I mean, some, some people want to join our team. So we have our own requirements. For example, you got to live close to the gym. Mm-hmm. That's one of the requirements. Uh, you need to find a job, uh, whatever job you have, it has to allow you to come and attend the classes. Mm-hmm. If not, uh, you're not, you're in the wrong business. And, uh, and there are people that if they have a fight and they're looking for uh, training partners, sparring partners, and uh, they want to commit more, we are open. We have an open door policy. So there are some days actually that we allow people to even to come and spar uh, as long as their coach uh, was okay with it. We were fine. And uh, uh, so we basically train every day uh, uh, from 11 till 1 MMA training. And at night we do like supplementals or Anybody is, uh, everybody's more than welcome to come mm-hmm. if they have, especially fight coming up. As long as they can find a place to stay, they can come and train um, full time with us. And uh, it's good for us because uh, we love people come and train here because uh, everybody contributes something, something to your team. And uh, it's a give and take thing. So awesome. That's amazing. Well, I want to say once again, really, thank you so much for willing to do this. Um, you know, from uh, one Persian to another, going to make sure to support you always, even though I'm in Quebec. So if you ever come to Quebec, you know, and you want to, uh, and you, and you, you just hit me up and I'll, I'll, I'll take you to some very for good sure restaurants. I will. You know, my wife, uh, she speaks uh, French. She's from Morocco. Really? So one day maybe we show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might show up in Virginia because uh, Bob. Uh, by the way, shout out to Sensei Bob Buchanan for uh, really make connecting us. Because I'm because like when I saw your profile, I said Bob, who's this Nima guy? And then Bob put in so much good words about you. So I got to thank Bob. You know, Bob was the one that deserves yeah. some most of the credit for uh, connecting us. Yeah, Sensei Bob, I know him for like quite a long time. He's a great person, and we've been connected for 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 many many years. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, guys, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, share when this interview is out and make sure to follow Nima and bye for now. Nice to meet you. You too.